Alrighty, good morning or good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Happy Tuesday. Hopefully, you had a great long weekend. Today, I'm going to talk about 26.2. This is basically the end of our chapter 26. There is a 26.3, which I'll likely post a video on, but it is more just talking about human evolution within the Chordate phylum, within the primate kingdom. So it talks about different ancestors. Um, that's not what we're talking about today. So today we're talking specifically about how chordates evolved, because last class we kind of talked about the main categories. And chordates are quite prolific and diverse in terms of body plans and as a species. So remember, this right here is kind of our example of a chordate. Oops. This is our simple body plan. And there are four things that all chordates have in common. So no matter which chordate you look at, they will have, or at some point in their lifespan, whether or not that's embryonic, they will have these four things. So the four things are labeled here. So we have a dorsal hollow nerve cord. And this is just a kind of a recap from what we talked about before. So dorsal hollow nerve cord is right here. This is our brain stem, runs along our back, so we call it dorsal. And following that up, you'll see there's a structure underneath, and we call this a notochord. This is before our vertebrae develop. It is a way of supporting our nerve cord, and it runs parallel and underneath or more internal of the body than the hollow nerve cord. Some creatures have this for their whole lives. A lot of the times, like for us as an example, this is in embryonic development. So we currently, as adults or teenagers, do not have this because we lose it because we have a spine. Next up, we have a tail. So right here, we'll see us kind of like, wait, what? We don't have a tail. This also includes embryonic development. And key bit is that there is a part of us that goes beyond our anus. So remember last chapter, we talked about this tail that extends beyond the anus. The last part that we have is what's called gill slits another name for them. Let me make sure I get the spelling right. We have pharyngeal throat pouches or just simply gill slits. These become gills in fish and they become lungs in humans. All chordates have this. However, a couple other things that we can talk about, even early chordates, some of them don't have it, but in general, we can see things like fins, skull-like structures, and then skeletons made of. So if we go far enough back, we start to see fins, skull-like structures, skeletons made of cartilage. Um, if we go a little bit earlier, we'll actually find chordates that don't have these, but there are generally six major groups. So I have them listed below as well as a few subcategories, and I'll kind of show you how these things develop over time. So our first category, we do have chordates that are invertebrate, mostly if you've ever heard of a sea squirt, that's these two things. They actually look kind of like sponges to me. They're different. They have a little bit more symmetry. If you can take a look, they seem to have this bilateral or at least radial symmetry about them. Um, there's also sea peaches. So even though these look very much like, well, 
periphera or sponges, they're actually chordates. They're very closely related to us in terms of animal phyla. Not much to say about those. As we move on, our next area that we come to is what's called a jawless fish. So these are fish without proper jaws. The two big ones are that we have today are what's known as hagfish or hagfishes and you may have heard of something called a lamprey. They're sort of an eel-like thing and if you notice they kind of have this I'll highlight it. They have they have a mouth, but it's sort of a soft opening. They can't really control. They can't chew, so they tend to attach with sort of like a sucker type feature. And to kind of give you an idea of what their mouth looks like, because oftentimes they're attached to rocks, it looks pretty nasty. So they don't have proper teeth. What they sort of have is this big serrated opening that they can kind of move around to in order to kind of dig into their prey. So it's not a jaw and it's not proper teeth, but it functions basically the same way. So main features of this is they do have skeletons. Already a big step up from the past one. These are almost all made of cartilage. They do have mouths, but what they can't do is they can't open or close. So part of that is because you need a jaw in order to kind of hinge the mouth open or closed. These lack that. They have ways of moving their mouths, but not in the same kind of range of motion that we would expect. And we say that they lack true jaws or teeth. They have, as you can see, teeth like appendages, but they don't function the same, or they function the same way, but how they work is slightly different. They're more of like serrated protrusions coming out rather than our teeth that are embedded into our jaw bones. Okay, a subcategory of these is we have sharks and skates. Oh, wait, hold on. Wrong skate. Sharks and, oh, there we go, skates. Let me just make an arrow over here. Now, when I say subcategory, they're definitely more evolved, but they kind of ran along the same lines of evolution. Now, this we call kind of a subcategory because it's almost a transitional phase. For example, you may have heard that sharks have bones made out of cartilage. However, they very clearly have mouths that can open and close. So they're somewhere in between, say, a bony fish and a jawless fish. So one of the things we can say is that they have jaws and teeth. The other feature that's important for us They have what's called pectoral fins. These are related to the shoulder, believe it or not. When we think pectoral, we generally think of our chest muscles, but they're attached to our shoulders, so we say that these are our pectoral fins. And they also have a pelvic fin. And pelvic is a hip. So what that means, or let me kind of highlight it. Both of these have, kind of highlight them on one side, and then sharks, they've got these two sets of fins here. And basically, this is our beginning of seeing this sort of four limb structure that will later evolve into all types of fish, and what we see in land animals, terrestrial animals. If we move on, we end up at bony fishes. And key bit, they have 
hard bone skeletons. So kind of the difference if you think of cartilage, places that you find cartilage in your own body are places like your nose and your ears. So they're rigid, they have structure, but you can kind of bend them, move them around, wiggle them. They're not as rigid as bone. So oftentimes we have a very hard time for one, finding fossils of these animals because cartilage is a much softer material. It doesn't fossilize nearly as well, which is why we generally can't find very well-preserved fossils of, say, sharks. However, bony fish, however, things like the megalodon, where we have these huge jaw muscle or jawbone fossils of these big fish, it's way easier for us to find those because they're made out of this hard bone. So this was our next big kind of evolutionary step in chordates. And this is actually where we see two, like a divergent path. So bony fish are kind of built into two categories. Or they're not kind of, they are built into two categories. On one hand, we have what's called ray finned fish. And on the other, we have lobe finned fish. So kind of here's two examples, and I'm kind of giving you some spoilers right now, but the idea with a ray finned fish is if you notice there's these kind of spiky protrusions that come out of these fins, and then there's kind of a webbing in between that makes the fin. Whereas with lobe fin fishes, they have this sort of more solid structure. It's not so much like webbing in between. Um, another way you can think of a ray fin fish is kind of like a fan. So if you imagine you have like a, one of those like folding fans or paper fans, they have sort of this structure. So highlight the bones in red and in between we have just simple tissue maybe muscle maybe just some scales depending on how thick it is depending on where in the fin you're looking but you find that there is a sort of thin layer in between whereas a lobe fin fish is much more continuous uh, another way you can think of it is that the fins are thicker or meatier. Now, this is a an area where we diverge. Believe it or not, these ones go on to become modern fish. Basically, all the fish that we know today are ray finned. In terms of lobe finned fish, the fish went extinct or evolved into early tetrapods. So, this is where we have. And because we have a couple of things forming, we have bones, but we also have a much stronger muscular structure around those limbs. So kind of the part that I want you to take away from it, if we go back up to sharks and skates, we have this pectoral fins, pelvic fins. So we have a hip and shoulder fins. And then as we develop into bony fish, these pectoral and pelvic fins start to get bones and they start to develop into stronger and stronger limbs. These are the beginnings of our four limbs that we see today in basically every land animal. So if we want to think about it, if we go left down the ray fin, this becomes our modern fish. This is where they kind of hang out. If we follow this right path, I'm going to get to what we call a fishapod. It's not quite a tetrapod, it's still a fish, but it can survive in the shallows and it can even go on land for a short amount of time. This one is what turns into our tetrapods.
and you may actually recognize this picture. This is a picture of Tatalik, and this was our sort of transitionary animal between land animals and fish. And there's actually a few of these still around, so like I said, not all of them are extinct. A good example of one that's still around is our lungfish, but even that one, we call it a lungfish because it can survive out of water for some period of time and kind of make its way across land. So you can see how this sort of evolution has sort of pushed them in one direction because of how their previous adaptations and structural changes have kind of helped them move that way. So with that, we get to our next stage. We're actually kind of following a timeline here if you want to think about it. So if I go back up, we started at the simplest forms of chordates. Then we eventually moved into jawless fish and we're getting more and more complex. So we're sort of telling this timeline story. So you can think of these notes almost as like a timeline. So our next big category. Oh, by the way, for the numbers, we just consider bony fish as one big category. So ray finned and lobe finned, this is one category. Sharks and skates was our subcategory. So jawless fish was our other one and invertebrates. So we're at currently getting up to number four. So now we start to see terrestrial adaptations. We started to really see them before, but now we have true amphibians. Now, some of you, in doing our frog pro or frog dissection lab, you'll have found that the word amphibian actually means something along the lines of two lives. So it's living a double life. And that comes from the idea that they live in water for a part of their life. And on land for the other part. Now, in some cases, frogs, they spend their adult lives in and out of water, but as a tadpole, they spend most of their time in water. In fact, completely in water, until they change into an adult frog. So this is what that's talking about. So now we see terrestrial adaptations. The next step is probably an obvious one. This is where we start to see our reptiles. Now the main difference between these two is, I'll use the word slimy skin or wet skin. So amphibians have a very porous outer membrane. So their outer layer, their skin, their epidermis is very, very porous. This is the other reason why we were saying that amphibians and frogs are indicators of good habitat health because they so readily absorb this any basically anything that's in the environment so if there's poisons in the environment frogs are basically the first to go because they very easily poison themselves just by absorbing things reptiles they have again they have land ad adaptations what they also have is dry skin and this is a very large, diverse group. So in the past, we have, there's going to be two branches, but in the past, we have our dinosaurs. So beforehand, so before dinosaurs, we had something called an archosaur. And keep it. This was our precursor dinosaur. Now, dinosaurs, I have a super accurate photo of them here. This was a diverse group of species. So what I mean by diverse, there was large and small, 
many habitats. And lived over a huge range of time. And so they, they're quite a diverse group. And what we think happened is that um, basically they went extinct due to climate change. And this is primarily because of what we think of as an asteroid impact. Now, there are descendants of dinosaurs, or what we believe to be descendants of dinosaurs, because as I've shown in other images throughout the course, what we actually think of dinosaurs when we think of, say, like these pictures might actually be inaccurate. We generally think now that a lot of them had feathers to some extent. So if I follow this down, what we end up with is birds. So right here in the middle, this is sort of our transitional bird, I'll call it. This is a dinosaur but it has several of the features that we would see in modern day birds. So it has feathers. Uh, another thing is, is their bone structure was very similar. And a lot of the things that make us think of birds like feathers don't fossilize particularly well. So it was something that we hadn't been able to really find up until recently. Now, birds are sort of an interesting classification. We can kind of think of them as sort of this warm blooded reptile. So they have the ability to regulate their internal body temperature in ways that reptiles can't. Now, the other big feature is that they have feathers. Now, that's obvious for us, but one of the things that stands out to us is that they also have this sort of two-part symmetry. So front pectoral limbs, they become our wings. Our pelvic limbs stay as limbs, but they become scaled, or they stay as scaled legs. And one of the kind of key features of birds is that they have this sort of scaly leg, which again kind of connects them to a dinosaur. Now, one of the things about birds is they're, they have an issue with classification. And I've brought this up before. So they are the same clade as dinosaurs, but we generally don't think of them as reptiles. We think of them as birds. But dinosaurs include reptiles. Or they're included in the clade reptilia. Reptilia, sorry. So we kind of come up with this issue. So there is recently in scientific communities or within the past kind of 50 to 100 years that we have a class that we call reptilia, but it's not a true clade. And remember a clade was where we had, if we thought of a cladogram, we had to include everything from a common ancestor. If we end up extending this out and we leave something out, so for example, this one may be birds, then it's not a true clade. We have to include all the descendants from that one point. Oops. Okay, I'm gonna go back up here for a second. So also in the past, 
there was sort of an evolutionary war pre-dinosaurs. So at one point we had our archosaurs, these turned into our dinosaurs. Now over here, there is another group of fossils that we have found. And this one, if you're a dinosaur nerd like me, this is what's called a dimetrodon. Now it's actually not a dinosaur. All those pictures and toys you may have had as a kid telling you that these are dinosaurs is actually a lie. These are actually what is referred to as terapsids. And you can generally find them or no notice them by early terapsids had this large sail-like structure on the back. What we think of it as is sort of a heat regulation. So because reptiles are cold-blooded, which means that they require heat from the sun in order to function, the more easily you're able to regulate your body temperature as a reptile, the more energy you're able to expend. So this big sail either had a warming or a cooling effect and allowed it to much easy, have a much easier time regulating its body temperature and in that sense gained an advantage. Now, the reason why I say that these are not dinosaurs is that terapsids actually evolved along a different path. So we had this sort of fight between terapsids and archosaurs in the past. So if I draw a line, this was sort of happening at the same time. There was a group called terapsids and there was a group called archosaurs. Now archosaurs, due to their adaptations, grew to become the dinosaurs or evolved over time to become the dinosaurs. And we can think that dinosaurs, because they are so diverse and generally they're very large animals, they basically dominated the entire world's habitats which means that terapsids kind of got pushed to the sidelines. They had to find a different niche in order to fit. So over time, they actually became smaller. So they evolved to be smaller to fit the niche they were left with. And what they found is that over time these terapsids evolved different structures. They actually started to become more maternal. They took care of their young in a different way. They started to become warm-blooded. These are actually the reptiles that evolved into mammals. So if I'm zooming out here, remember how I said that this is sort of like a timeline and a branch? Well, this is still telling the same story. There's still this branching system, but now we have reptiles splitting apart into two different categories. So this is actually how we eventually ended up at our last classification, which is mammals. So this is our number six. So here are some mammals for us. They have several characteristics. First one that stands out, and it's going to seem a little strange when I say it, is hair or fur. Now there's one here that we would look at and be like, that doesn't sound legitimate. And when I say that, I'm, of course, talking about the dolphins. So believe it or not, they actually have some hair-like structures. It's not prominent because hair is not great for swimming, but it is still there. Other key features of mammals, they're warm-blooded. Or I'll use the more technical definition, they can regulate their internal body temperature. Now this is very good because it allows us to have high levels of energy and exist in colder climates. This is why we find polar bears, but we don't necessarily find, or we can't find, say, a snake in the Arctic. 
It's simply too cold for a cold-blooded animal to be able to live. It needs to be able to form its own body heat in order to survive. So this was a huge advantage in extending the range of these types of animals. Other things, they have four chambered hearts. Again, if you did the frog dissection, you'll actually remember that a frog's heart only has three chambers. It has two atria and one ventricle. Whereas we have two atria, two ventricles, and it's the same for all mammals. Other thing, because we raise live young, we have mammary glands that produce milk. And in fact, this actually goes back into the terapsid group where as they were evolving, they found it much better for survival in order to care for their young for an extended period of time. So we actually see very early on, even in the age of the dinosaurs, that this trait was becoming prominent among mammals. So let me scroll back down. Now there's sort of three subcategories of mammals, at least in the modern era. Now, there's three types. The first one is going to probably be a new word for you. There's what's called a monotreme, which are these here. Now, we'll come back to them, because the other two types are what's called marsupials. And finally, we have our placental mammals. So if I zoom out without giving it away, I specifically picked a not well-known monotreme. Now, take a thought, we have two different types. We have marsupials and we have placental mammals. So this third one is sort of the odd one out and they're very rare. So to talk about them first, I'll show you a different Oh, I gave it away. So these are our monotremes. So monotreme refers to that they lay eggs, and there's not many of them. So these are our egg-laying mammals. And I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure that these five are probably about the only five that we'll see. And you can see that for the most part, they're pretty well related, at least these ones here, four out of the five, have very similar body plans. And then there's a the platypus, which is just kind of a really strange animal in terms of evolution. It has a lot of different features that we don't really expect. I'll maybe talk about that more later in a different video. But secondly, we have marsupials. Now, key thing that makes marsupials different is that they have live birth at a very early stage. So they don't have a placenta, which means that they don't have a direct blood connection to the mother. So they're born at a very early stage, basically as a fetus, and that they finish developing inside a pouch. So the best example of this that we know is a kangaroo. Now, there are several marsupials. It's more common than a monotreme for sure, but it is still fairly rare in terms of the large scheme of mammals. Finally, we have a placental mammal, which is, like to put it simply, this is what we think of. So when we think of a mammal, we're generally thinking of a placental mammal. This is where we have sort of a long gestation time, uh, live birth, and that there is a organ called a placenta. 
which provides nutrients to, I'll just call it developing embryo and fetus. So we all have sort of a remnant of this placenta. It's the umbilical cords, or so our belly button. That was our direct connection. The placenta is on the wall of the uterus, or it's part of the wall of the uterus, and it basically has this kind of blood connection, similar to our lungs, that it, it has this very close connection between the child's lung, or blood and the mother's blood, and it's able to exchange nutrients without actual direct contact. So this is generally what we think of when we think of mammals. The other two are a little bit more rare, and in terms of monotremes, they're very rare. All right, so these are our six categories. Like I said, I'm going to post probably a little video on 26.3, but this is generally the end of the tale unless we want to get more specific. So hopefully that was helpful. If you want, if you find it helpful, you can always do the practice problems or the practice module for 26.2. This is optional. I'd rather have you work on your project, but if you're finding you're getting a little stuck, take a look. Maybe it'll have some information that'll help you. And as always, take care.